Alrighty, folks, welcome back to the Transacting Value Podcast. Now, you may remember this as SDYT, the podcast. Uh, we've since changed our name, and that concludes season two of this podcast. And now, officially, the 4th of July, 2022, we're opening up season three with episode one of the Transacting Value Podcast with a good friend of mine. He's an outdoorsman. He's a Star Wars fan, and he's really just a supremely awesome dude. His name's Robert Ballou. We'll get into that in just a second. But first of all, if you're new to the show, either as SDYT, the podcast, or currently as the Transacting Value Podcast, welcome. I'm Porter. I'm your host. If you're a continuing listener and you've made it through this name change and you've made it to Independence Day now, early July 2022, then welcome back. Folks here domestically in the United States and around the world may or may not recognize what it means to have freedoms and to be free quite in the same perspectives. Honor may not be defined the same way. Initiative may not be guided by the same principles and tenets. However, those are our three core values for the month of July here on the podcast, and we're going to talk about all of them. So folks, without further ado, let's turn it over to Rob. But for now, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is the Transacting Value Podcast. Alrighty, folks, welcome back to the Transacting Value Podcast. Again, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and we're talking honor, initiative, and freedom as our core values for the month of July with a good buddy of mine, Rob Ballou. Rob, what's up, dude? Guy, what's going on, man? Happy 4th of July. First yeah, off. I appreciate <laughs> it, man. Happy 4th. Happy 4th. You guys got big plans? What are you thinking? Oh, I mean, there's probably going to be a barbecue. I'm probably going to eat a bit more than I should. And then probably pass out early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a best part of the culinary festivities of the day. I'll tell you what, man. This guy took a steak, salted both sides, and then put it in a broiler. A couple minutes mm-hmm. each side, flipped it, whatever. Uh, it looked great. Okay, that was the intro to his reel. And this was only like 30 seconds. So it was just bits and pieces that you saw. Well, then somebody played off of it. And they took a steak and brined it. They used pickle juice, random seasonings, put it in a Ziploc bag in the fridge overnight, and then cooked it on the grill. It looked better. I've never brined a steak before. All right. It looked better. Uh, it was unbelievable. It looked fantastic. Yeah. How are you guys prepping your meats? Because that's uh, a big deal. You know, honestly, most of the time we're just using like, you know, there's a marinade, you know, my wife makes a, a an, an extremely nice marinade that I, I don't know what she even puts in it, man, because I'm not privy to that secret. Uh, yeah, yet. yeah. You know what I mean? But, oh, my gosh. It's, I mean, we're just marinating it overnight, really, and then throwing it on the grill. It's to die for. Is it um, steaks? Is it chicken? Is it pork, fish? What What's uh, this just, good with? Just, just steaks. Oh, just okay. Steaks. You know, because there's just two of us, and we don't normally make a lot of food. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, just a little bit. I will say, though, on this past Memorial Day, we went to a barbecue at her brother's house. And, man, he had, um, they're like filet mignon cut. Sure. From, like, Fresh Market or something like that. I'm going to tell you right now, Josh, I don't know what he did to them, but they were like meat cupcakes. Oh. All right? Like, like almost like almost cut it with a spoon. Jeez. Tender. Yeah. Oh, my. Oh, my gosh, man. <laughs> Like, you, you, it's like it's like something you had to experience <laughs> it sounds like it yeah man we actually it was memorial day weekend barbecued chicken right pretty standard staple on the grill brined them for two or three hours before i put them on the grill and put them on a smoker right no sauce no nothing just brine some seasoning and then put them on the grill i used a little bit of charcoal and a lot of bit of oak logs that's it right some lighter fluid on the charcoal to make sure it was going and then mm-hmm. made a, a little stick log teepee to trap some of the mm-hmm. heat and then torched it and waited till the logs got going and then leveled it all out, put the rack on the wood and then cooked over the wood. Oh, man. Game changer, man. Do you have a, do you have a nice a nice smoky flavor in that? Yeah. And I got to tell you, oak's not my favorite. Like, I'm mm. not even a big bourbon fan just because of the flavor usually is pretty oaky. Yeah. This was delicious. I think the brine helped because it stayed moist. I didn't even add anything as it was cooking, but unreal. I- I'm definitely a big smoker fan over propane. I'll tell you that right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you did. I-, I heard from somebody that if you-, you use lighter fluid on the briquettes 
on, on your charcoal. Yeah. Do they, if you get like a hint of that, like lightery fluid taste in the meat, you, have you experienced that? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes, especially cause I don't really know what I'm doing. I just, <laughs> I just put it on there. Uh, let it You're set for start. a couple minutes. Yeah, sure. It's just <laughs> eyebrows, you know, and then <laughs> I, uh, it's cheaper than waxing. I'll tell you that. I was I was I was wondering why there was a, a part in your beard up the middle there that seemed pretty clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get too close one time, you know. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah. No, I, I've definitely gotten that taste on occasion. I found letting it set for a little bit longer, just having a bit of patience helps because then the fumes dissipate, so it's not all trapped in the smoke. Yeah. But yeah. while we're talking about stuff to eat, there's also stuff to do, right? So I assume from what you said, you guys are going to hang out with family and relax. Oh yeah, yeah. Fireworks? Ooh, you know, I'm, I'll tell you right now, hot take. I'm not that big into doing fireworks myself. I mean, I I love making things blow up just as much as any other man does. <laughs> um, but you know, it's like it always feels like you go out, like like you go out as as like a, a regular person, and you you spend so much money on fireworks, and then it seems like they're always gone too quickly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like I feel like a hundred dollars worth of fireworks should set me up for like a good long while. Yeah. And I feel like I like four or five things off and I'm done. I'm like, oh, oh, that was it. Yeah. It's like 16 all over again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What about watching shows though? Those can be fun. You know, there's, there's a chance, uh, we might go down here to Venetian gardens in, uh, in Leesburg. I yeah. think, I think they're doing a fireworks show. We might go down to the Venetian gardens and check that out. Might actually take the boat out there, and uh, you can you can put your boat in. You can go and you can watch the fireworks from on the water. That'd be cool. Um, you know, as, as long as our as long as our afternoon daily afternoon showers here in Florida yeah. don't crop up, might might end up doing that. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 So for any of our listeners, again, talking to talking to Rob Berlu, quite quite the outdoorsman, right? So you're on uh, Harris Chain of Lakes, I think, in Florida. There, right? Yes. Yes, Harris Chain of Lakes. So very big, very big area. Yeah. I mean, I've heard they connect basically East coast to West coast, like Gulf to Atlantic. Not so much Gulf to Atlantic. However, they do connect to the Atlantic ocean. Um, if you went out through, there's just a series of, of canals. One of the connect all the lakes in the chain. Um, those will eventually lead you to the St. John's river. And then you can take the St. John's river all the way up Florida to Jacksonville and out into the Atlantic up there at Jacksonville. So you're telling me Daytona southwest to Tampa Bay is basically an island? Pretty much, yes. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it all connects. Whether it's man-made or natural, I'm not 100% on that. Supposedly, there's places in it where it's like you can just barely fit a boat through, like a larger boat. When I grew up here, the people that I grew up next to actually made that trip once a year. They had like a like a 24, 25 foot boat had like a cabin on it. Yeah. And once or twice a year, they would just literally put their boat in the water here on Lake Eustis and go to Jacksonville. Whoa. <laughs> just and just go. I don't know if it took them a week or two weeks. It was just like their vacation trip. That'd be they cool. They just though. cruised down the waterways and yeah. Have you done anything like that? No, I've I've never done anything quite like that. I've been on some trips kind of like that in the Everglades. I don't know if you know or not, but if you go out there, they have these these structures called chickies. No, what is um, that? they're pretty much like big docks out there with roofs on them. Uh -huh. They're just scattered throughout the Everglades, and if you check in with like the ranger's office, you can reserve a chickie, and you have to have like a permit and all that stuff. But you can reserve a chickie for however many nights, and you can put your boat in there at the boat ramp, um, like at let's just say Flamingo. And you can journey out into the Everglades, journey as far as your chicky, whatever. You get there, you can set up a tent, you can tie your boat up to it, and you can pretty much camp there on the chicky in the middle of the Everglades. That'd be cool. Yeah, I'll give you, it's it's probably a better winter trip. Oh, really? Because, yeah, well. because of humidity or what? Bugs. Oh, because okay. of the bugs. <laughs> yeah, okay. That makes sense. Well, so setting up something like that, like, or an individual or a family or a group outing or something? Is that something you can just go online and apply for or does it take uh, a process? Yeah, pretty much. You just have to go. Just, if you just go on there and just Google the Everglades National Park, there is links on that website. You can go in there and you can get the permit to go out and, 
you know, reserve your chickie and that would be cool. I imagine a lot of places like that, let's just say in Florida, or really even the majority of the eastern seaboard in the states is being developed, man. Like price of land is appreciating, even though the real estate market is starting to crash. Right. Like it's it's yes. coming back down to reality, but land is never going to devalue the same extent never. as buildings are. Are you finding in some of these areas that there's a lot of development and or developers coming in? Man, well, I'll tell you right now, we're just here in our our fair city of Leesburg. Well, I'll just tell you, man, in that in that year since you've been here, we have probably had another three, four hundred homes built in the area. Whoa. Because I work for the city, so I'm I'm kind of privy to a lot of this. You know, like you're working with the contractors and stuff and we're oh, putting sure. things in the ground for this new stuff. They're just about to complete a big subdivision down off 27 called Lake Denham. There's another subdivision going in off of Radio Road. There's really? another subdivision going off, going in off of 44. Um, there's another subdivision going on down 27, like down toward Royal Highlands and stuff like that. And then the villages, obviously, is just coming down like the middle of florida yeah they're and huge though the, the city actually supplies gas and electric to a, a new section of the villages that just got built out so there's like another i think there's like 1400 homes in that section Man. and then they have another section coming in on the back side of leesburg that's going to be like another three or four thousand it's growing at a rate that i, I mean i just don't i don't think we we can sustain like the the traffic here now in Leesburg is getting ridiculous. Are you I mean, seeing a lot of construction to, and road expansion and all that? Oh yeah, yeah. They're they're trying to keep up with it, but you know how road construction goes. Yeah. You know, like by the time they finish it, it's already outdated. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, I four has been under construction for thirty years. So. <laughs> I, I hear that, man. Even up here in Virginia, there's a highway called sixty four. We're expanding sixty four. We're adding a median. But I mean, the good thing is. You get lane closures during rush hour. So it really helps you bring communities together. Yeah, do a parking lot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, man. But I mean, if you go online and you look, man, there, I mean, you can just go on and Google like what state has the most one way U hauls. It's Florida. The number of people moving here now is, is out of control, I feel. Sure, you know, sure. as a person who I guess you could technically consider me a native, even though I'm not, I wasn't born and raised here. I mean, I've been here for like, the last 31 years. Well, so pretty um, close. Yeah, I mean, yeah. pretty close. It's kind of crazy. I mean, it used to be that, you know, we'd have the snowbirds come in and then, you know, in the summertime, all the snowbirds would leave and it's like, oh yeah, this, everything kind of empties back out. Yeah, room And the amount of people that are now just staying year round, it's great. Yeah, so for any of our listeners, uh, if the village is seems like a foreign concept, Picture a, a retirement community with a bunch of golf carts, probably more golf carts than vehicles, uh, like street legal vehicles. 100%. Yep. And, um, but fully sustainable, funded, basically their own post office. Actually, they do. I think they have two post offices, which accounts for two different zip codes. And you've got, I don't even know how much acreage. I think it's a couple hundred thousand acres. It's, it's probably even more now. It's substantial. Like supposedly now this is hearsay so don't quote me on this one but supposedly the village's plans to go down to like highway 50 oh <laughs> yeah supposedly i do know of areas out here that the village has that the villages has purchased that hasn't been developed yet but it's in but the villages has the land they're just waiting for the building to catch up to that there's that, a there's apparently apparently there's a construction company out here that has a 30 year contract with the villages for land clearing and development. Hey, smart move. 30 years. Yeah, smart move. Lock years. them in. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Speaking of locking in, as I understand it, you recently got married. By the way, congratulations. I I did. Yes, I liked it, so I put a ring on it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. No, smart call, man. I'm I'm happy for you. You said that you weren't born in Florida, though. Where were you born? So I was born in Georgia, kind of right across the border, but I was born in Albany, Georgia. My parents moved down here when I was three years old, and then I've pretty much been in Florida all the rest of the time. I've gone to other places and visited and stayed for, you know, sometimes months on end. I used to go to Kentucky a lot and stay there for a couple months at a time, but, uh, you know, my mailing address has never pretty much not been Florida. You know, there's a lot of things that Governor DeSantis is doing and planning and integrating now. I think that even in the last 30 years, 
is going to have more longer term benefit. I think, for example, but that he signed into state law to start teaching financial literacy in high schools, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I did see that. Uh, have you heard anything good, bad, or indifferent about that? Is it that big of a wave? I don't, I really don't know, to be honest with you. I haven't heard much about that. The, the news cycle has been dominated by other things here. Um, that one kind of slipped through the wayside. Our recent, the controversies with Disney and everything else like that. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. They've kind of kind of dominated the news cycle. So while like, I saw that story, it was kind of, it's kind of pushed the sidelines. <laughs> I imagine so. so. Yeah. So for everybody else, Disney, the theme park, has been its own sort of special governmental jurisdiction for what, 30, 40 years, something like that, maybe yeah, longer? Yeah, at least longer, yeah. probably. Yeah. And in that process, they've been able to, you know, get money, fund, finance, do whatever they needed to do concerning zoning or rezoning without much approval or disapproval from the state. That's no longer the case. They have essentially outlived those freedoms, you might say. And so Florida as a state is now restructuring that deal. Uh, but for the majority of Central Florida, Disney has an impact. Their area of influence is almost the entire center of the state, not just Orlando area, coast yeah, to coast, well, I mean, north and south. I mean, well, I mean, you're talking about an entity that employs just, just in this Orlando, in that Central Florida area, that employs something like 76,000 people. Yeah. 76,000 people. and that that deal they have, I guess it's it's not going to go into effect until next year. Oh, okay. Is when it's supposed to run out. If there's one thing I've learned in this country um, lately, it's that you can say whatever you want to, and the court's like, mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, and then, then they just and then things just get paused. It's funny you mentioned that it's not just federal courts or or municipal or or whatever courts now that you got to take into account. You almost got to factor in social courts. Right. Social media yeah. like TikTok opinion and all this stuff is actually swaying some policies. Yeah. The court of public opinion is powerful. Yeah. Powerful. You give in to fear. You give in to hate and anger. That's how it goes. <laughs> you know, you got to be careful. While well, we're talking about Disney, have you ever been before or as a kid? Oh, many times, many times. Okay. I was actually, I was there April the 27th. Oh, this year? Yeah, this year. Oh, okay. So yeah, even more recent. How do you see these changes? We talked about the Everglades. We talked about Disney, obviously. We talked about local to your area. We talked about social media briefly. But how do you see these things changing over the next three to four decades, right? You have kids adopted, biological. You've got nieces, nephews, whatever happens in the future. How do you safeguard the things that you've got now, the nostalgia, the memories, the places, the cultures for them? You have to try and take responsibility for things now. I feel like lately, um, with the way our political climates have been, there's a big segue into this. It's it's either black or white, right or wrong, us or them kind of deal. To where if you if you care about preservation on things, you might seem one way or the other. I don't feel like that's personally true. Mm -hmm. I feel like that if you think you know, let's just say, caring about your environment is a thing that's more commonly associated with liberal agendas, if you will. Sure. Um, however, the the resounding amount of outdoorsmen are mostly conservative. It just doesn't jive right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because if you're if you're an outdoor if you're an outdoorsman, you consider yourself an outdoorsman in addition to enjoying our natural resources and enjoying time out in the wilderness and God's creation with your friends and family, you should also want to take the steps you can to preserve the things that you enjoy for your children, your grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I don't see wanting to protect the things that you love as being a liberal thing. Right. I mean, I don't know. You can tell me if I'm, if I'm off base on that or not. I don't necessarily consider myself one or the other in the political party system. I have some views that I skew more conservative on. I have some views that I skew more liberal on it. It is what it is. You know, the one thing that I don't think has a political agenda is you know protecting the outdoors and what you enjoy doing in it. Well, being outside is just something that's always been with me. My father was a professional fisherman. His idea of babysitting for me was being two months old in a car seat in the back of a boat. <laughs> All right, so so like I had I had no choice when I was born. Like I was barely I think I was barely a month old, and my father had already purchased 
a lifetime Florida fishing and hunting license for me. Man, the eighties were a different breed, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, I had, I had no choice in the matter. Yeah. Like I was going to, I was going to be in this one way or the other. So, you know, and it's just something that I've grown up with. I, my dad has a, had a photograph of me at 18 months old, falling into the water, making a cast with a rod and reel. I like mean, <laughs> casting. Yeah. Well, no wonder you fell in. You just you just went with it, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Good lord. I mean, it, it seems like most people nowadays, like I wouldn't consider an eighteen month old old enough to do anything, hardly. You know what I mean? But apparently, my dad was like, "Nope, you're good enough. Get get out there. Get out there, James." <laughs> it's literally just been something that I've always been steeped in. It's always been a part of me. I, it always will be a part of me. Well, I think that's you the know? catch right there. I think you just said it basically that politics is for policy changes. I think character is for future people changes. It's where and how it gets instilled. Uh, you know what? Let's take a break for a second, though. We'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about honor, initiative, and freedom and, and how those things have impacted your ability to balance your own goals, maybe, with what happens in life and how you've got to adjust and adapt. And, you know, sometimes you don't always land the big fish. So maybe we'll get into some cool fish stories, too. <laughs> more um, often than not, you don't land the big fish, actually. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I pulled back an awful lot of water and empty hooks, but we'll dive into that here in just a second. Everybody sit tight on the Transacting Value podcast. Folks, I'm Porter, host of the Transacting Value podcast. You're being personally invited to increase empathy worldwide through shared values. Hey, but why do you say it like that? That's not what we talked about. No, it's not. Why do you call it an invitation? Look, guys, there are people around the world who have listened to our conversations with guests and they've trusted us to build perspective over different topics through shared values. The least we can do is invite them out to hear more of the content that they enjoy while still reminding them that season one and season two of the podcast are still listed under the old name SDYT the podcast. Right, eh? That makes sense, Porter. But just tell them that if they go to YouTube and search Survival Dead YT, they can find all the old videos in playlists, along with season one and season two. Right? Or if they want to hear some of the other interviews from those seasons that they can still find them everywhere that our favorite podcasts are streamed. I'll just do it. No, I got it. I'll let them know to stay in touch through the Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter pages by searching at The Transacting Value Podcast for comments, critiques, topic ideas, or to become guests themselves. I'll make a note to say thank you to all of our show sponsors and partners and just say that I appreciate all of our new and continued listeners. And then I'll close out by saying I'm Porter, I'm your host, and this is the Transacting Value Podcast. Folks, this is Will McClone, host of Scotch Scotch Stories on TikTok and occasional co-host of the Transacting Value Podcast through Survival Dad YT. If you haven't stopped in to listen or interacted with any of the social media, you're missing out. There is topics like gender equality, mental health, abuse, drinking, depression, and divorce. But there is also gratitude, appreciation, respect, courtesy, and self-empowerment. For different perspectives talk through shared values, tune in to the Transacting Value podcast every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on all your favorite podcasting platforms. Hey y'all, it's Jules here with The Bee and the Bear Creations. We specialize in custom tumblers, t-shirts, car decals, and anything else you can think of. If you are looking to order a custom item for yourself or for someone else as a gift, please go find me on Facebook and shoot me a message and we'll get that order started for you. Again, you can find me at The Bee and the Bear Creations on Facebook. I look forward to helping you create your custom item. Alrighty, folks, welcome back to the Transacting Value Podcast. Again, I'm Porter. I'm your host. I'm sitting here with Rob Ballou. We're talking about conservation efforts, waterways, preserving trees, preserving the environment is one thing. Preserving ways of life and cultures and customs is another. Preserving what makes you feel nostalgic for future generations is totally another. But all of them require some sort of conservation and active effort to ensure that there's consistency. First off, to all of our listeners, welcome back. Primarily, though, Rob, what's up, dude? Welcome back. Ah, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you're, you're welcome. It's been an illuminating day. It's been an illuminating day. Is it because the sun's up? Yes, actually. It's very hot here in Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I imagine, man, I see your fan going in the background. I'll tell you, I'm a little jealous you guys got some palm trees, though. I'm a big palm tree fan. Uh, I mean, yeah. I've got a couple of, 
couple of really nice palms out here. They make some kind of berry that I'm not quite sure what you can use it for, but they smell delicious. I'm not too familiar with that either. But for our listeners, where we left off, essentially the last point we made was how the divisiveness of politics aside, the definition of politics, the application of politics, is that it's meant to focus on policy, guiding principles for the legitimacy and legislation of how certain things play out at a federal level. If you want to, like in this case, have a conversation about different topics that requires political input, or at least on mass media, has gained political input, it doesn't have to get political because we're not impacting policy. We're just having a conversation. And that's when character comes more into play. How you guide the legitimacy for decisions for future people, not future policy. How you impact the lives of future people, not future policy. That's where we left off. And so to bring us back full circle, Rob, I'm curious, man, we talked a little bit about conservation as it applies to the environment. And you had mentioned the Everglades and chickies and being able to camp out for a weekend or so, for example. If you were to take from where you are, either by hard road, asphalt road, or waterways, let's say down to the Everglades, are they still over the last three decades or so that you've been on them, the same condition that they have been? You know, they aren't. Things have changed, and it's just a fact of life, right? As society moves forward, as progress marches on, things are going to change. Uh, I feel like it's how we deal with those changes that sets us apart from generations past. For instance, there's a, you're familiar with the Crystal River Homosassa area, yeah, right? Florida. The Nature Coast is called the West Coast. I recently read a, uh, a book. It's called Lords of the Fly, which is uh, it, it's about the hunt for the world record tarpon. For anyone who's not familiar, tarpon, is, it's, a, it's a large oceanic fish. They're completely silver, covered in gigantic scales. If you hook one on a rod and reel, they jump, famously jump. I mean, like I said, once again, Google is your best friend. If you Google just tarpon, there will be so many pictures you can look at that are just fantastic. So many great videos. But, you know, it, it's a fish that literally you can catch them in some of these backwater areas around the coast where they're five, six inches long. And then that same fish in a few years will be 40 or 50 pounds. Jeez. And then in a, you know, in a few more years, we'll be up over 100 to 150 pounds. I believe the world record was like up over 200 pounds. It's caught off the coast of Africa. Tarpon in the 200 pound range have been observed. You know, I mean, like, they're, they're a gigantic fish. Yeah. I mean, easily over six, seven, eight foot long, monsters out there swimming along. So not predatory towards people. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, they're just, they're a giant fish. They're a majestic fish. They're a very long-lived fish. And anyways, this book is about the hunt for the world record tarpon. Because I guess in the, in the, in the 70s, 80s time, it became like a, like a race, almost like the moon race, you know, to be who see if you get to the moon first. Sure. You know, this became like a race among outdoorsmen to see who could catch the biggest tarpon. And the area out by Homosassa, Crystal River, that area there, back in the 70s, 80s, it used to be a gigantic place for migratory fish. Like these tarpon, they're a tropical fish. When the weather starts warming up, they migrate up the coast from the Keys and up around the coast of Florida. And then out into the Gulf, you can catch them up in the panhandle on this migration. There's people who've seen them out like Louisiana, even Texas way. You know what I mean? As far as their migration. Um, but there's, there's a quote in the book that says, you know, like in the eighties that you could go out there and man, it looked like you could walk across the backs of all the tarpon that were out there. Jeez. One guy talked about being on plane, which is, you know, running the boat as fast as you can for 30 minutes and you just never stop seeing fish contrast that to today now here in 2022 our tarpon migrations have become somewhat lackluster even how do you qualify that i mean to the point now where it's like you go out there and you're lucky to see you know just on a let's just say a regular day when the tarpon are in migration you know i mean you have a window now of a few hours in the morning time you might see 
a pod or two of fish that's like five or six fish per pod. Mm. You know what I mean? You know, contrast that to someone saying like, man, it looks like I can walk across the backs of these fish in the 80s. You yeah, know what I mean? I'm, I'm picturing like a flats boat just skimming over these fish, right? E- exactly. Exactly. And, but, um, but so part of me is skeptical that that just sounds idealistic, not actualistic. I mean, maybe it is. Who can say? I wasn't there in the 80s. Well, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> touche. But um, however, I mean, you know, these gentlemen, the, the gentlemen that are being quoted in this book and that are giving the information are, are people who in the fishing world, especially the fly fishing world, are like, you know, kind of revered names. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? You know, they're kind of like the, you know, the pioneers of the, of the, of the sport in saltwater fly fishing. Even the last few years, you know, people have said that the, the consistency of the tarpon has been down. You know, I mean, as far as them showing up. Another example, you can look at satellite imagery of an area on the east, of, east coast of Florida called Mosquito Lagoon. Uh-huh. Mosquito Lagoon in the, I mean, even in the mid-aughts, you know, 06, 07, even up to, I mean, gosh, I was going out there in like 2011, 2012. You know, I mean, there was just massive grass beds everywhere, you know, just green sea grass, fish everywhere. Whereas contrast that now to today, I mean, you're lucky if you find any grass in the Mosquito Lagoon. It's mostly all sand. From what? A lot of it is from chemical runoff, landscapers and whatnot. You know, as as progress and development comes up on the uh, on the edges of the lagoon, you know, people want to have that oceanfront, waterfront property. Uh. You know what I mean? It, you build these large homes there, and then people have to take care of the grass to make sure it looks all nice and green the pesticides and everything else that you throw into the water, you know, the people or it just gets dumped in the water. Maybe you apply it before rain and it just gets washed into the water. Sure. Like mosquito lagoon is not a tidal area. It's literally a lagoon. And so that stuff just sits in there. You know what I mean? It doesn't get swept out with the tides and refreshed. It I just see. kind of sits in it. It's like a big pond, honestly, or I guess closer to be a lake. It's not a, it's not an all at once scenario. You know, it's years and years and years and years and years of this has contributed to where we're at now. Yeah, I you get that. I, mean? I get that. We had some spots when we were growing up as kids, uh, namely my older brother and I. We'd go out with Dad on a weekend or, or whenever we were with him. And I don't know if you're familiar with a place called Ancloak Key or Chasawitzka. Oh, yes. Yeah, Arapika. So we would go out there, namely more around Ancloak Key. But, and I remember there was this place Dad used to call it the Bat Cave. Right, we had to park on the side of the road. It was a two-lane lime rock crushed type road. We park on the side of the road. You walk on the ditch on the side of the road out into the sawgrass, and then you would get back to these mangrove trees that grew over the trail. And I'm I'm saying trail loosely, just that it was people that had walked the grass down. Okay. Yeah. And so he called it the Bat Cave. Anyway, so you walk through the Bat Cave, and you would get back to this these lime rock pits. So the water was super ultra filtered, super clear. But once you got out past those pits, it was mangrove, salt water. It was on the Gulf Coast. So, you know, there was fish, crabs, whatever. It was its own beach. I was little, right? Maybe a grand total of like three and a half feet tall. So I couldn't tell you exactly how far away it was from the truck to the water. But, but I remember going out there it was the coolest thing, right? We had egrets and herons and we had obviously all sorts of crabs and sea life in the water by the time you got there and ospreys now you have two-story homes three-story homes the back cave is gone the lime rock pits are closed you know everything's filled in uh it's not the same anymore you could get cabins out in arapica on the water that basically fed down from the swanee or in from the gulf that now you can't they're, they're not there just like you said people have built houses and and, and things have changed. The sawgrass flats aren't there anymore. And if they are, the animals that were there aren't even there anymore, right? Aside from some fleas and some roaches, sea roaches and whatnot. But like, <laughs> you know, they're not going anywhere. But like the, the environment's totally changed, man. I, I can't speak to the waterways so much. We were never out on any more than like a canoe or a john boat. It's totally different, man. Everything, it's like the deforestation of the coastline, just not a forest. Well, and like what you touched on is, is is really like my like my overarching fear, I guess you'd say, for the future. Yeah, how how old would you say that you were at that time frame? 
when you would go out there with your dad? Oh, around then? Uh, seven or eight. Seven or eight years old, yeah. right? And going out there, I mean, can you just try and think back? When was the last time you experienced that sense of wonderment yeah. and joy? Like the ex- the exploration and seeing you know, this area that's just like, wow, this is so beautiful. Like, when's the last time you experienced that? I mean, in its own rights and settings, I've been around the world on a few different deployments now that have compared to seeing some of that scenery like that. But I can tell you specific to that area, I've never been anywhere since then where it was the sort of mental, emotional first mover advantage. And that's what I'm saying is that, like, you know, there's still places in the world you can go and you can get that sense of wonderment. A big one to me is Colorado. Recently, in the last four or five years, I started going out, flying out to Colorado and spending a week, two weeks out there every year, mm-hmm. you know, trout fishing out into the into the wilderness, pretty much. And I mean, you know, there's places you get out there where just, you feel small. You know what I mean? Like, like you're reminded that in the grand scheme of things, you really don't matter all that much. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like you look at the, you know, you look at the, at the terrain and just the, the expanse of wilderness and you're, you know, and you're like, if, if no one touches this, it's going to look exactly like this in another 20, 30 years. Right. Minimum. That's a place that I, I've experienced that, that same sense of like joy and exploration is like, you know, like you walk out into a new area for instance, I'll just I'll just give you an example. There's a place up there called Cheeseman Canyon. Okay. That you you park in at like a trailhead, and it's like a mile and a half hike into the canyon, right? And you're just kind of walking through woods and kind of walking uphill. You know, what I mean, and it's fun because you're like, oh man, this was like a cool hike through the woods. And then you come out into the canyon, and you're on a on a like you said, like it's a trail. But mm-hmm. it's pretty much just an area that people walking has worn down. Yeah, sure. Right? And it's about as wide as both of your feet put together. Oh, man. And to the left of you, it's like a 200-foot drop to the river. <laughs> like you're just on the side of a canyon. Yeah. Right? And there is there's not a cell tower in sight, obviously. There's nothing out there but just rugged wilderness can't help but be struck by the natural beauty of it Mm -hmm. right i mean you can be down there fishing in this river you know picking your way amongst the rocks and look up and there is a herd of bighorn sheep making their way along the other side of the canyon if you're in the right time of year you can hear elk bugling in the area you know i mean you can be driving to the trailhead and see moose crossing rivers by the by the road you know what That'd I mean? Be wild. Exactly. It's that's the best word for it. It's wild. Well, so that, I mean again, that kind you, of freedom you can't recreate. Exactly. And like you said, contrast that here to Florida, where with our development and people wanting to move here, those natural areas are quickly dwindling away. I mean, I might not be the most eloquent person. I might not have the most facts on all of it, but you know, I feel like everyone can do their part to try and protect these natural areas. There was recently a big thing happening down in the Everglades where one of the, the sugar companies down there, the sugar cane, wanted to like dump runoff into the Everglades. And that was like a big deal. They're like, this is going to ruin the Everglades. This runoff and these chemicals, it's going to, it's going to vastly affect the natural ecosystem. You know, there's already things that are affecting the ecosystem in, in the Everglades. Burmese pythons are one. If you've heard about that. Have you heard I about have, that? yep, yep. You know, and that's just people wanting to be, I don't know, unique, whatever, getting these snakes. Once the snakes get too large to be, you know, to be housed in a tank inside your house, they're just like, oh, let me just drive it out into the wilderness and just let it go. It's just a snake. Well, now you have a uh, an animal in the Everglades that grows to be in excess of 15, 16 foot long that will actually eat an alligator. Yeah. <laughs> An animal that has no natural predator here in this in the ecosystem they've been dropped into. They've flourished in this area, and other things, other native animals have had their populations go down as a result. Yeah, I you remember I, mean? I remember hearing something similar to that. Uh, I think it was a gray wolf population in Yellowstone was the study at the time. 
But same sort of circumstance, not related to Burmese pythons, but related to having to adapt to their environment. There was a super yeah. drastic decline in their population until they made a few changes, obviously. And then, you know, foxes, animals, birds, other smaller woodland creatures made a comeback in the meantime, and then it balanced itself back out. But I, I think that's yeah. sort of the thing, right? Everything wants to, and, and you know what? Maybe there's even a, a natural law about this. I can't remember off the top of my head. Anybody more knowledgeable in science, feel free to, to comment on this episode on Spotify or something and, and put it up there. But there's a natural law, I think, that says everything tends towards a state of equilibrium or wants yeah. to, at least. And so how much time that takes, though, who knows, right? But the amount yeah, exactly. of relative devastation humans, let's say, can have on an environment before humans need to stop completely or, or not as much so the environment can recover is an exponentially longer process than it took to get to that level of detriment. It's like Elon Musk refers to uh, often uh, colonizing Mars and, and uh, SpaceX and solar energy over basically natural resources, right? Where it's a matter of time that humans degrade the environment to a point that's unrecoverable. Yeah. I think to that same end state, it's a matter of timing before humans do something about that, right? It may not be yeah. our generation. It may not be our lifetime at all, uh, but it could be. Well, I mean, hey, if you want, if you want a simpler metaphor for it, um, I mean, look, look, looking at you here, I, I see you don't have this issue, but for you know o- other people in the in your in your listenership that might be approaching that middle age and you know packing around a few more lbs than you want to, <laughs> I mean, you know, think about how easy it is to gain that weight. And then how much harder it is to get rid of it. Oh, sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind point. of what it is. Like, it's so easy to make the changes to the environment. It's not easy to revert the changes. That's true. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. But um, then it takes a conscious effort to maintain it as well. Exactly. Yeah. Alrighty, folks. This is Porter with the Transacting Value Podcast. If you're listening to this interview and you've listened to some of our others, then you already know we're playing on Spotify. You already know we're playing on iHeartRadio. Stitcher, Audius, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. What you may not have known is we're also on YouTube. So if you find yourself with the odd opportunity for some background noise or a decent conversation, or you're at work or maybe lunch, search the Transacting Value Podcast, and you can listen to all of your favorite podcast interviews as well. Now, if you have anything you want to suggest for a topic, or if you want to be interviewed, feel free to send an email to survivaldadyt at gmail.com or send a direct message on Facebook or Instagram at The Transacting Value Podcast. So, folks, from me to you, I appreciate you taking the time to listen and support the station. For different perspectives with shared values, guys, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is The Transacting Value Podcast. Alrighty, folks, this is Porter with The Transacting Value Podcast. If you haven't heard of Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Let me tell you about it. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. That means from an app, a desktop, both. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, or even Stitcher. And there's plenty more where you can choose from. It's basically all you need to make a podcast all in one place. And Anchor is totally free. So if you're interested and you want to find some value for your values... Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. If you're looking for high quality, locally sourced groceries, the Keystone Farmer's Market is the place to be. Alongside our signature homemade boiled peanuts, we strive to offer only the best locally sourced pasta, baked goods, jams and jellies, farm eggs and dairy products, meats, and even seafood, as well as a great selection of fresh produce. That's the Keystone Farmer's Market at 12615. Tarpon Springs Road in Odessa, Florida. The place with the boiled peanuts. Think about how easy it is to gain that weight and then how much harder it is to get rid of it. Oh, sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's kind of what it is. Like, it's so easy to make the changes to the environment. It's not easy to revert the changes. That's true. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. But Um, then it takes a conscious effort to maintain it as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. 
you know, like they said, there was a there was a big social media campaign regarding that stuff that I was talking about in the Everglades mm-hmm. that stopped a lot of that dumping of stuff from Lake Okeechobee into the Everglades. Florida organizes a, a python roundup. <laughs> you know, every year they, they, they pay people money per snake that they turn in to try and remove members of the population to try and keep the numbers in check. Just recently here in, in our area, they passed some sweeping changes to the fisheries laws as far as what you can take, what areas you can keep fish in and whatnot, you know, to try and mitigate some of the progress and the increase in people that are now fishing. Because the outdoors have seen a a marked growth here in Florida in the last couple of years, as far as fishing licenses being sold, boats being sold, and just people on the water. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they've taken some steps here lately to uh, to mitigate some of that and try and protect our natural resources. But once again, I feel it's everybody's. If you enjoy these things, it's your responsibility to honor what you what you love and to uh, you know to help it continue to be a viable resource. Well, I think that's um, how it goes with any relationship, right? If you sort of honor the integrity of it and, and the loyalty behind it and the trust you're given within that relationship, then that's how you maintain its integrity and, and maintain its worth and its value for other generations to look at and, and try to embody, not to get too metaphorical here, but I agree, right? And and people to plants is the same consideration as people to people from that perspective. I mean, for instance, like, you know, I, I get, I don't really, I don't necessarily keep um, a lot of fi- I, I do a lot of fishing, not to not to toot the own horn, but toot toot. I uh, I tend to catch a lot of fish, but I rarely, rarely, if ever, keep any fish to bring home to the table. You know, I have a lot of people that ask like, oh man, why? You know what I mean? Like, oh, you're out there, you're catching all these fish. Why don't you ever bring anything home? At at this point in our civilization and what all that, like you know, I don't need to keep these fish in order to eat, right? Oh, I see. You know what I mean? Like these, like these fish are not necessary for my survival. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got a refrigerator full of stuff right now that I haven't eaten. When I go out and I catch, you know, a couple of redfish, I don't need to keep those fish in order to eat. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I just let them go because that's a fish that, you know, your son might end up catching. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a fish that someone else's son might end up catching. That's a fish that if, if you get your enjoyment out of it and you, you enjoy the fight, you enjoy the, the puzzle of putting together, you know, fishing and, and putting together the where the fish are, what they want to eat, the weather, the tide, all that stuff. You get to put this puzzle together that ultimately culminates in you catching a fish. You've got your enjoyment out of it. A big thing that I, I don't necessarily agree with is we have a lot of we have a lot of charter captains around here. You know, you have a lot of charter captains. They make their living guiding people to catch fish. Sure. Right. And I 100 percent support that because I think the more people that are involved in fishing and enjoy fishing, the easier it is for people to want to protect our natural resources. Oh, yeah. Right. Yep. You get you get the word out. You have people that have great experiences in it. You automatically want to protect something that you had a great experience in. Sure. Right. But my, my issue with it is that a lot of these people, you know, that are come from out of state or whatnot, you know, they come, they catch fish, they want to keep the fish to take it home and eat it. And while I get it, and there's obviously limits in place for people to do that, and that's considered sustainable by people who have much more education than I do, to, to what end is that is that keeping, really? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, what, what, what fulfillment are you getting out of the fish after you've done the whole deed? Once again, I'm going to clarify that is a personal opinion. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, aside from not being hungry, right? The activity yeah, exactly. once once you get them into the boat, the activity's over. Well, I suppose that depends uh, on your perspective. I mean, like you brought up in the beginning, is it necessary to encourage a love for the environment for future generations? No, because you can get food at the store, at least here or in a developed country, you can get food at the store for these said future generations to be able to eat. So killing the foods you catch, not necessarily. However, if what you're teaching is how to fish, how to clean, how to eat, how to survive, well then sure. Right. Yeah. But, but finding a balance between the two, right? Like it's a, I guess a more extreme parallel. If you're going to go, you mentioned elk before, if you're going to go hunt an elk to clean it, to eat it, to pack it out, to take it to wherever you got to go, whatever, not just to hunt it. it. That's 
an irreversible hunting trip, but that's the difference between hunting and fishing. Hunting, you're not catching and releasing, because if you do, something else is eating what you just killed. Yes. Uh, so really, you've limited your options in terms of a release game and future sustainability. But yeah, concerning fishing, man, everything changes. So would it make a difference to the rest of the country as a country if, like we said, the bottom island of Florida disappeared and there was no more tourism coming to Florida? Uh, no. No, they'd adapt over the next few decades and they wouldn't notice. Of course, of course. You know, you amputate a hand, you figure it out. But it changes everything having it. Encouraging that level of sustainability and that level of education and awareness, uh, it's not necessary to kill everything that you catch, right? So when we're talking about encouraging that level of character and decision-making and discernment for future generations, your kids, other people's kids, whoever, are you as a future older adult compared to now, what advice do you give them? How do you build that kind of character and discernment? It has to be education. And, you know, I mean, I'm not talking education into, you know, the crazy, you know, like crazier things that are more divisive, like, let's just say climate change. Sure. Um, it's just it's just education on 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 minuscule things. Like, you know, if you're out there, like you, know, you don't throw your trash in the water. You'd be surprised at how many times you're, you're out there. And I mean, I've been miles away from the shoreline and you snag a beer bottle. You know what I mean? You mm -hmm. snag up, up, you see plastic bottles out there floating. Sign of the times, I guess. But I mean, I've been out there miles offshore and seen a, uh, you know, a face mask oh, yeah. floating in the ocean. You wow. know what I'm saying? And like, now I know that obviously you can't mitigate this completely because the Florida wind is the Florida wind and hurricanes and all that stuff. It's going to sweep things out to sea regardless. You know what I mean? That I just know it's not all coming from, you know, by chance being swept into the water. Yeah. Right. You know, education on, you know, what the fish and wildlife has, has deemed as the appropriate limits. There's been a few stories, not necessarily from Florida, but in other, you know, in Florida and in other places about people getting caught with two, three, four times the legal limit of fish. I think there was one, it's, it's in a different state, but uh, these people were caught with like 106 crappie when like the limit is like 15. Jeez. And you're like, oh yeah, well at least you caught those guys. And it's like, yeah, but the damage has been done because the fish are already dead. They're already gone. Yeah, you're not you putting them back. I mean? yeah. yeah, like, I mean, it's going to take two or three years for that number of fish to replenish. Because, you know, you might think, oh, I see plenty of fish out there. But, you know, to, to really replenish what's being taken out of there, it takes a while. Because just because, let's just say a fish lays a million eggs, right? Mm -hmm. A million fish don't make it to adulthood out of that, that brood. Sure. You know what I mean? That hatch. You know, I mean, let's just say that something like only maybe 10% makes it to adulthood. That's a lot less than a million. <laughs> sure. And then that's distributed over an area too, not just within one ecosystem. Exactly. That's over the area of, let's just say the Gulf Coast, sure. right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the, you know, the one or two things that you do, like they don't, it just, it all adds up. It's all cumulative. Well, so, you know okay. I mean? So we're talking primarily inland waterways, tributaries, whatever, right? We're not talking like deep sea exploration or like, you know, random navies compressing their trash and then dumping it into the ocean. We're talking more inland, more localized type waterways, right? That's what I would more say I'm dealing with. Just because, you know, it's, like I said, it's things that you can teach people locally, you know what I mean, that like each person can can do their own part. Sure, yeah. Just little things, like I said, as far as like, do you really need to keep the fish that you caught today? Did you have a great time? Did you make memories? Do you really need to keep those fish or can you release those fish so that you have, let's just say the limit right now where I'm at is okay. two redfish per person, four people that go out on a boat. You all catch your limit, right? And that's eight redfish. I mean, do you guys need to keep all eight of those fish? Right. Or can you release, let's just say half of them and only take four. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's four more fish than that. Let's just say this next spring have a chance at breeding and making more population. Yep. It's just little things like that. And I think that we've, we've come into this era where we're like, 
you know, yeah, like do what you want. Like it's your right. Do whatever you want. You know, I, I don't think we take a lot of time to think about like, but should we though? That's a whole nother <laughs> level of awareness right there. Exactly. Right? I know. I know. Could you and should you are two different things despite the similar spellings, man. 100% <laughs> I agree. And you could attribute that to anything, right? Like you're talking conservation in terms of wildlife and waterways. But let's take the same principle that you just said. Here's a point. We talked about uh, Governor DeSantis. He's the Florida governor, at least for right now. Passed this law where he's attempting to get more traction on teaching financial literacy in schools. We talked about that a little bit ago. Yes, yes, we did. Yeah, but it's the same principle. Right? Let's talk about financial literacy as a parallel, or you don't have to, and I will. But the point being, if you have this much money per month, that doesn't mean you have this much money available to you. Those uh, million eggs, for example, the 90% that go away and don't make it to adulthood is the same amount of money you've got going to bills, other expenses, revolving debt, consumer debt of whatever kind, generally yes. speaking. right? So now out of that let's say $100 a month that you thought you had available, it's actually five. That's all you've got, right? Is the same 10% of eggs that make it to adulthood to your analogy earlier. So understanding if this is more your flavor and sort of more country living isn't your vibe, think about it in the same regard, right? Like you've got X amount of money cash flowing every month, what comes in vice what goes out. But until you stop to think about how much is coming in, how much is actually going to what needs to be spent, and how much am I superficially spending? Until you start to control your cash flow, you can't make any positive changes for the better because the more money you spend over the course of, say, a decade, the less money you have saved to do something with a decade later. Yeah. And I think a lot of that stuff translates pretty directly to conservatorship when it comes to the environment. Taking care of the environment doesn't just have to be this more... I guess, trending in the U.S. anyways, liberal consideration. Like you said, there's plenty of Republican people who value the environment, but the way it gets publicized is not the same perspective as, say, a a liberal perspective towards the environment. But the principle's the same, right? Take care of what's yours. it should be. It should be, that's for sure, right? (laughs) But could it be or should it be, man? We're back there. But, you know, like... It's so interesting to me, at least, namely because I have a relative social ineptitude, I think, but it's so interesting to me to understand the concepts behind the constructs because they're common to so many people that treat them differently. Like values, for example, right? I'm not as avid of a fisherman or an outdoorsman as you are, but here we are, however long we've been talking about wildlife and conservation from your perspective, experience, and expertise – compared to mine, and we're still able to have a conversation. We've talked about politics three or four times, haven't yet argued about it. I haven't even heard you raise your voice. Uh, There's no need for any of that, right? Like the concept behind the construct can still be similar in that regard. And so when we're talking about how do you save the environment, well, let's talk about finances. It's not about donating to a campaign cause, right? It's, It's about illustrating the fact that if you learn how to manage your money, you can learn how to better manage your life. If you learn how to manage the environment better, you can learn how to better create an environment or cultivate or maintain or sustain. And I think that's something that is not as widely publicized either. Correct me if I'm wrong, even in Florida, you know, sure you've got 4-H in some areas, which if you're listening further out around the world, 4-H is a uh, essentially agriculturally centric organization, breeds that level of understanding primarily but uh, rodeo farming, those types of things. There isn't anything like that in, say, high schools, fishing, game, education, conservation, awareness. Is there? No, not really. No, not really at all. Well, so um, what do we do about it? TikTok videos and Instagram reels? To be honest with you, yes. I mean, <laughs> I feel like sometimes that's that's the biggest flaw is that we uh, – well, okay, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. This is an example that I, I saw that – kind of makes sense going back to like your money like you said like donating to a cause and all that stuff like that there was a uh, a committee made um to their goal was to spread cancer awareness okay right sure and so they went around people donated money to them you know blah blah blah, blah. they had you know fundraisers and balls and all this stuff like that 
And then someone finally asked them how much they had contributed to cancer research. And the answer was nothing because they were just to raise awareness. I would say you have to look at like where you're, if you're, if you're going to donate to a, uh, to a conservation place, you know, look at what they're doing for the environment versus what they say they're doing. If they're just raising awareness, they might not actually be really putting anything back into the actual environment. They might just be letting you know there's an issue. Kind of like that, uh, if you remember that commercial a while ago, it's like, oh, I'm just a security monitor. I just monitor if there's a threat. <laughs> yep. You know what I mean? Yep. But yeah, man, as far as getting the message out there, I mean, you know as well as I do, the currency of today is, is in the social media realm. Granted, it can be a bit fickle, but I mean, you can reach infinitely more people with a viral TikTok video than you can with a letter being sent out or something posted somewhere. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. So I'd say that, yeah, that's the way we need to go. Is that, you know, we need to make the kids aware of it now on, on social media that there's, you know, things that they can do just to help out. And because I, I feel like most kids today, they want to help out. They want to be a part of something. Well, I mean, look at all the challenges that are on TikTok. Everybody wants to compete, wants to, you know, show off them doing this challenge, right? Yep. There's a social aspect to it. I mean, what if we could do something along those lines with conservation? I mean, that would be, that would reach millions of people. Oh, yeah. Especially with the right hashtags, the science behind it will do the work for you. Exactly. Yep. So much of this stuff, when you when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, it's a bunch of stuffy older people, you know what I mean, that meet and, and argue about things, and then nothing gets done. I mean, if you look at people that are in the the demographic of, like, let's just say, 16 to 25, right? So much of their world now versus when we were that age revolves around your phone and yep. what's going on online. I feel like that's the place where we need to be reaching out to try and teach these things. We Well, let's say 15, 20 years ago, all right, when we were that age, I guess earlier on around that age, we were looking at Friday night social gatherings as going to the mall, right? Remember Lake Square? You go to the mall, you go to Gators Dockside, whatever. You go do something, but it's physical, it's in person. Yeah. And so if you wanted to reach somebody over the last couple decades prior to these ones, you go to the mall or colloquially to Lake County, you go to Walmart. But, you know, you, <laughs> yeah. you go to the mall and that's where you find kids just hanging out, doing absolutely nothing, just hanging out at the mall, right? You're not shopping for clothes. You're not doing anything productive, Lord knows, but you're hanging out at the mall. Okay. So if you need to find somebody, you go to the mall. If you need to yeah. figure out what people are talking about and what they're interested in, you go to the mall. Today, I don't think it's that different where businesses do the same thing over the last call it three decades primarily, you want to reach people, you want to reach kids, you put it on TV because that's where it was in the 90s. That's where it was yeah. into the 2000s. It was more on TV, people transitioning away from malls on, on the grand scheme, at least in the States. So you go to where they are, you meet them where they're at. Okay, well now there's such as, it seems like such a hesitation overall for organizations, businesses, whatever, positive in application or negative in connotation to reach kids via social media. It gets this weird, destructive kind of vibe, this negative, pessimistic perception of, well, I don't want to jump on Twitter. I don't have a Twitter. I don't want to get on Instagram. I don't have an Instagram. You're hearing it now worldwide with NFTs and Web3. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why would anybody do that? Uh, I've got the same picture already downloaded on my phone. Okay. People said the same thing, 1995 to Bill Gates. I saw this on YouTube. 1995, David Letterman is interviewing Bill Gates on The Late Show. And he says, Bill, tell me about this internet thing. I'm sure you've heard of it. <laughs> and Bill's, Bill's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar. He says, well, what's, what's the appeal? Right? He said, well, here's the thing. This is Letterman. He brings it up and he says, here's the thing, Bill. I just heard recently that you're going to be able to stream, not like we know it today, but like to play a baseball game being played live, but on your computer. And Bill said, yeah, that's, that's correct. That's, that's the internet. And Letterman says, I mean, have you ever heard of a radio? 
He says, yeah, sure, but there's there's a, a few small differences. They're not major, but there's a few small differences. And Letterman says, yeah, what's that? And Bill Gates says, well, you can play it however often and however many times you want. And Letterman says, yeah, okay, but have you ever heard of a tape recorder? It's the same sort of parallel, right? Nothing's changed. It's just a different method, a different mechanism, a different medium, you might say, for being social. Where We're in the 1995 of NFTs, of Web3, of the metaverse, Potentially, it could all fail, just like the internet could have then, but based on the application and drive and conscious effort to make it better consistently, chances are high it's going to succeed. It's got the potential to. It's the same thing with reaching kids, right? As companies and businesses are more hesitant to reach, I don't have an Instagram, I don't want to get on social media, it clouds judgment, it distracts people, maybe so, but like we've also seen online, that's where the money's at. That's where the attention is. That's where the businesses need to go. Because that's the future. That's how people are communicating. Right? Like this mm -hmm. now. We're not talking face-to-face. -face. We're on a video call. Yeah. What's the <laughs> difference? But you got to be able to meet people where they're at. If we had to rely on just talking to each other face-to-face -face by being physically together in the same space, nobody would ever talk to each other. Nobody would stay in touch with families anymore. You've got to adjust and adapt to be able to, I guess, metaphorically evolve with the times. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I got a question for you. You mentioned... Colorado and your, your trout expeditions every so often. Well, we're talking about migratory patterns of wildlife. Does that ever change to account for changing environments? They go somewhere new, shrinking environments. They go somewhere more plentiful, like, you know, Littlefoot and his family moved type stuff. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great callback right there. Thanks, man. I mean, just before I say this, can I just ask, was there anything more traumatic as a child than Littlefoot's mom dying? Bambi was a close second for me. I mean, but, I, I but Littlefoot had a bigger arc and a bigger impact. So, <laughs> I mean, wow. Yeah. Just, just wow. I mean, that was like a great movie that just started out by ripping your heart out of, of your chest <laughs> immediately. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And but, I mean, that, that defined a generation. Yeah, you're, you're right about that. Yeah. But yeah, man. I mean, that's what the main, I guess you say, side effect is of our, footprint that we put on on the on the nature is that animals change their habits they change where they go it's been hypothesized that you know bringing it back to what i was talking about the tarpon that came into the homosassa area there was something that brought those fish there something that's changed and because of that now they don't come back in such great numbers mm -hmm. right when they make the migration the tarpon still make the migration they just don't make that pit stop at Homosassa any longer. Not any longer, but in as great a number as they used to. Something happened. The same thing happens out west, and like you know, there's not Colorado area, but out on the uh, on the west coast of the country, you know, you'd have sea run steelhead. You know, it's a, a form of of trout salmonid that would you know they they come in from the ocean. And they travel up. I mean, you've seen the you've seen sure. the nature documentaries. You know, they travel up the rivers. You know what I mean to spawn. Yep. You know, it's a it's a thing that's hardwired into their you know into their brains. They go back to the area they were born. So what happens when we dam off a river, and those fish can no longer make it to where they need to go, or their brain tells them they need to go to procreate? What do they do? They change. They go somewhere else, or they just die and we lose that generation, Stop. that population. That's the result of us. Yeah, well, I mean, that's true, right? You start picking and choosing. I mean, look at the supplement game throughout the fitness industry. It's the same sort of thing, I think, where once you start meddling with natural, I guess, equilibrium and chemicals, uh, deficiencies is one thing, right? Medical conditions is one thing. Don't get me wrong. Medicine in it, as an industry is totally necessary. But once you start tweaking little pieces, you're going to get unforeseen consequences that then you also have to supplement to bring those levels back up to reach some level of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. and, and when it comes to nature conservancy, it's definitely a similar consideration because the more variables that people start to move around and, or change or just indirectly even impact, the more variables you have to account for and try to address and balance back out for sure. Mm-hmm. A random question that I had. Sure, it just popped in my brain. Have you ever heard of someone who, despite being in phenomenal physical shape, 
has an unforeseen incident happen and let's just say dies, right? Yeah. Let's say you have a yeah. a weightlifter that all of a sudden, you know, their heart just fails, right? You have a runner that all of a sudden their heart fails. People who for, you know, if you're on the outside looking in, like me or you looking at them, you might like these people are in almost peak physical condition, right? Like they're as healthy as you can possibly be. But at the same time, they're not healthy. Could that be because of the supplements and whatnot that we're now putting in, you know, that we're saying is necessary for your athletic or fitness goals? Yeah, man. You it's, know what I mean? It's the chemicals dumped into the watershed. You know, it's the <laughs> same principle. You can't be 70, 75 some odd percent water and not expect it to be poisoned over time. The more chemicals <laughs> yeah. you add to it, you know, like if art mimics humanity, humanity mimics nature, in my opinion. Okay. Right? And so the thing about it is you look at Ronnie Coleman, for example. He was Mr. Olympia in a few different years, and then he wasn't anymore. He was not an Olympic athlete because his hips and his back and his knees gave out, and now he walks with a walker or crutches and takes dozens of joint supplements and rehab and physical therapy, and his life is nowhere near the affluence that it was. Great dude, I'm sure. All sorts of experiences, right? Watches things on mm -hmm. Netflix or YouTube. But like, that's exactly what happens. And then you look at power lifters. I don't want to say all the time because I can't say to that frequency, but power lifters die because of the amount of supplements they take, whether it's HGH, Dynaball, whatever type supplements, to get bigger, right, as steroids. The thing about these steroids, and I'm not saying all of them, because there are some that are necessary. You take a liver supplement, that's a steroid by definition. It may not be super synthetic to the point where it's doing as much damage, but it's accounting for the damage you've created. And now it's supplementing yeah. a process you can no longer naturally do. Exactly. But, but the point being, these I'm, I'm using power lifters as an example, but you jump up to 350 pounds, maybe 425 or more in the off season, the growing and shrinking of your body is going to take a toll. And then your yeah. organs growing and shrinking to accommodate that level of stress. You don't need that much muscle to hunt and survive anymore. Now it's for show. Maybe pride, maybe ego, but for the most part, show. I want to yeah. be able to be bigger, faster, stronger. That's what you're going to get. But here's what the risks are that it comes with. You know what? I don't want to hear those things. Nah, I'll be all right. I got plenty of time. Gone. Right? It's gone. No, it's cool. It'll it's not gonna last forever, but it lasts for now and I'll worry about forever tomorrow. That's a future me problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, the future is today compared to yesterday. I mean just look at look at people look at all the people who like who uh seem to be let's just say living to very ripe old ages. Sure. It's always people who you'd never expect. Right? Just a just a for instance. My dad lived to the, the ripe old age of 85, yeah. right? I mean, has there is, is there obviously people that are older? Yes. Um, but I think 85, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty good number. <clears throat> My father didn't, didn't pass away because of his body failing. It was, it was his mind. And that's just something that happens. Dementia is a, is a terrible, terrible thing. But, you know, I mean, you see these people that live to like 100 over a hundred, they're just normal people who just do normal things, mm -hmm. right? It's like the people who do are the ones who are just living, you know, well, that aren't putting that's all the, the argument stuff in their bodies. Yeah, but that's the argument, right? Like you can live to yeah. be 125 years old, hypothetically. How remarkable was your life then? You clearly took it easy and had it relatively stress free. That's that's the argument, right? Only the good die young, so to speak. I think that's a misconception. You mean to yeah. tell me in a hundred years you don't have any remarkable memories? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Did you did you not make, or let's say this: Did you make a world changing, society shifting impact on the planet? Maybe not. Probably not. In fact, probably not. Until you're the one person that made it to a hundred and sixteen that the world says, "How'd you do that?" Let's do an interview. You know, and then you just changed the entire biological medicine industry. Exactly. You man. know, like who knows where it goes, but, but you're right, man, to your point, 85 years old, especially now today, 
is becoming not as old as it was 30 years ago. Yeah. It's, it's the, it, you know, orange is the new black, so to speak. It's, <laughs> it's, it's becoming a younger age, but in 85 years, think about all the fish he released. I know. Think about all the places he went, all the memories, obviously, and skill sets that he gave to you guys. But that doesn't even include indirectly the amount of people that he was social with, that he reached with his titles, his awards, his records in eight and a half decades. That's a long time. I think five years is a long time. And man, I'll yeah. tell you, if you don't think four or five years is a long time, go ahead and enlist in the military. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying there's anything against it, but a lot can happen in four to five years. If you don't believe me, go to school. Go ahead. Go to college. Yeah. You tell me how slow every class goes, but how fast every week ends. And it's the same. Cons- you look back on your life. Better case, you look forward on where your life could be. Or maybe you look back on your life and think you made no changes. Think you would serve everybody better if you weren't around. Maybe you look back on your life and you're like, I haven't impacted or changed anything for anybody. If you genuinely believe that, obviously I'm not a counselor either. Go talk to somebody, get help uh, or, or suicide prevention hotlines and groups. But if you legitimately think that that's the case, disorders, diseases, and things aside, if you legitimately think that that's the case, Think about everybody you've indirectly ever talked to or impacted. You said you remember things from seven, eight years old. You've seen pictures that have reminded you of things or taught you things indirectly when you were 18 months old, maybe even a month old you heard stories about. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, man, I forget a lot of stuff. I've got post-its to find other post-it notes up on my walls so I know where to get things done and how to accomplish things in a schedule, right? I've got four different whiteboards in here. I forget a lot of stuff there's a very real possibility that I'm not the only person that that applies to. And there's a very real possibility that people are going to forget their accomplishments. However, if you can honestly sit there and say that you remember something from 30 years ago, so vividly that you want to recreate that memory and that sense of wonder and emotion for a future baby, you or grandkid, you or nephew, indirect, you, how many indirect relationships have you built? Over the course of 30 years, five years, four years, 85 years, you don't have to remember what you said or did. I mean, now we've got digital media to remind you, but somebody else may remember what you said or did. And you may never know, you know, but it's that kind of an impact that can change things globally. It doesn't have to be a direct application of your talents to do it. So, yeah, man, I think 85 years is a long time to make a really substantial impact. Whether we know it or not, somebody's learning something from us. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that uh, that quote that Tommy Lee Jones says in Men in Black. You know, where he says, he's like, you know, 500 years ago, we knew the earth was flat. But, you know, 50 years ago, we knew we were the only people in this, on this, you know, in this galaxy. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. But I think he also said... These kinds of things happen around you whether you know it or not. It's only now that you're aware that you notice it and you can do something about it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that and that everybody likes pie, which I also agree with. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, I think think that's parfaits that everybody likes. Ah, yes. I mean, mean, have you ever met somebody like, hey, let's get some parfaits. They're like, nah, man, I don't want a parfait. Parfaits are delicious. There you go. There you go. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's because of the layers for anybody listening. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so cool that nothing really changes that much conceptually, right? How it's applied, how it's understood, how it's interpreted, sure. The words we use in our language is going to change. The point is there's so many things that change even in our lexicon, even in our discourse and the way we describe things and the words that we use, let alone different languages in different regions. That even though those things change, what we're trying to describe, the level of emotion, the experience, whatever, we're still just trying to convey to somebody else. The words that you use don't matter. You can tell me that you want to start calling your arms legs, and that's fine. As long as I understand whenever you say legs, you're talking about what I interpret to be your arms. Got it. I understand. We can still have a common understanding despite those words or languages. 
right? Those barriers. So how do we raise awareness for conservation? How do we raise awareness for wildlife refuge and sustainability, energy or otherwise, but to safeguard those memories that we've got from childhood or to further those memories for future generations? The language, I think, is irrelevant. The method, I think, is irrelevant. Making the effort, I think, is what matters. And then future generations will interpret it however we want. And it's a matter of somebody making the effort and giving it a shot, and eventually it'll catch on. How many videos have you searched for on YouTube in your battle rapping exploits in high school or whatever to find these inspirations and say, God, this is from 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, but you never heard of it for the last 20 years until that moment. You never know what's going to stick around, what's going to last, and what's going to click. So, yeah, I agree, man. And, and the, the awareness is, is the biggest thing. Uh, but I'll tell you, man, for the time being, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day so we could talk about all this stuff, conservation in general, because obviously it's undervalued, I think, and underrated as a conversational topic, but also because we're able to inject a little bit of your perspective, uh, a little bit of our value system, and then make it relatable for everybody else who maybe has never even been to Florida. So uh, I, I appreciate you making the effort, man, and being able to sit down and have the conversation. So thanks for coming on the show. Damien, I appreciate you having me. Yeah, of course. And for anybody that wants to reach out to you, send you a message, or, or just follow your fishing exploits, maybe you said you've got photos up on Instagram. How can people follow your travels and your uh, adventures? It's at that guy Rob with two Bs okay. on, on Instagram. All right. And for anybody listening, as we put up posts on the show for this interview and advertise for this interview, I'll tag that Instagram profile and that'll take you to Rob's profile as well. If you want to follow on which animals he's catching and which animals he's releasing and we'll hold him to that and make him accountable for his own words, <laughs> I suppose. But yeah, okay, cool. So are there any other resources as far as conservation or saltwater fishing, fly fishing, anything like Lords of the Flies, for example, that you might recommend for somebody who's interested? Well, I mean, if, if you're interested in learning more about it, you can look at, there's a, a couple of places. Uh, one of them is the uh, the Bonefish Tarpon Trust. I believe it's bonefishtarpontrust.com or the uh, Captains for Clean Water organization. I have no affiliation with either of those organizations, but those are just great sources of information. All right, cool, man. Yeah, I'll make sure to make a note of those in the description for this interview as well so people can find those links or those websites. If I can track them down, I'm sure they'll be able to as well. But for the time being, again, I appreciate it. And to everybody listening, I appreciate you guys taking some time out of your day to follow along with this conversation. And if you want to join in, if you've got any suggestions, critiques, or comments, feel free to send an email to survivaldadyt at gmail.com. Send a direct message on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter to survival dad YT. You'll be able to track us down there and we'll get our responses as soon as we see your comments. Please follow this podcast. Please rate it. Jump on Spotify or anchor or Google or Apple podcasts anywhere. You can hear your favorite podcasts as they stream. I appreciate your time guys with that. I'm Porter. I'm your host. And that was the transacting value podcast. <laughs>